The times on the morning of the day on which the new governor was to receive his office at the hand of the people, Hester Print and the Little Pearl came into the marketplace. It was already thronged with craftsmen and other plebeian inhabitants of the town in considerable numbers, among whom, likewise, were many of the many rough figures whose attire of deerskins marked them as belonging to some of the forest settlements which surrounded them in the little metropolis of the colony. So here the Puritans are coming together. How do I Contrast between the Native Americans and the Puritans there. The key. Native versus Puritans. On this pu public holiday, as all other occasions for the seven years past, Hester was clad in garment of coarse gray cloth, not more by its hue than by its some indescribable peculiarity in its fashion. It had the effect of making her fade personally out of sight and outline, while, again, the scarlet letter brought her back from this twilight indistinctness and revealed her under the moral aspect of its own illumination. Her face so, her face so long familiar to the townspeople showed the marble quietude which they were accustomed to behold there. It was like a mask, or rather, like the frozen calmness of a dead woman's features, owning this dreary resemblance to the fact that Hester was actually dead and in represent to any claim of sympathy and had departed out of the world which she seemed to struggle. So Hester's still in the background. She's still, like, faded in the back of society. It might be on this one day that there was an an expression unseen before, nor indeed vivid enough to be detected now, unless some perpetually gifted observer should have first read the heart and after and have afterwards sought a corresponding development in the countenance and mien. Such a spiritual seer might have conceived that, after sustaining the gaze of a multitude through seven miserable years as a necessity, a penance, and something which it was a stern religion to endure, she now, for one last time more, encountered it freely and voluntarily in order to convert what had so long been agony into a kind of triumph. So she's, her personality, like, isn't there. And or the her freely and voluntarily, though, is very important there, right? So I'd underline the freely and voluntarily, um, that she is, she's doing this on her own. Nobody's forcing her to do this. It is her own free will, um, even more than it has been in a lot of other cases. Look your, last, look, your last on the scarlet letter and its wear, the people's victim and the lifelong bond slave, as they fancied her, might say, yet a little while and she will be long to your reach, a few hours longer and the, deep mysteri and the deep mysterious ocean will quench and hide forever the symbol which she has caused to burn upon her bosom. So she's leaving and it's going to leave behind all the misery and everything that the letter has brought in brought on her. Nor were an inconsistency, inconsistency too improbable to be assigned to human nature should we suppose a feeling of regret in Hester's mind at the moment when she was about to win her freedom from the pain which had thus deeply incorporated with her being. Might there not be an irresistible desire to quaff the, a last long breathless draught of the cup of warm wood, but or, and aloes, with which nearly all her years of womanhood had been perpetually flavored. The wine of life, henceforth, to be presented to her lips, must indeed rich, deli must be indeed rich, delicious, and exhilarating in its chaste and golden beaker, or else leave an inevitable and weary languor after the lees of bitterness where, with, wherewith she had been drugged as a cordial of in, intensest potency. Pearl was decked out with an airy gaiety. It would have been impossible to guess that this bright and sunny apparition owned its existence to the shape of a gloomy gray, or that a fancy at one once so gorgeous and so delicate as must have been re requisite to contrive a child, the child's apparel was the same that had achieved a task perhaps more difficult in imparting so distinct a peculiarity to Hester's simple robe. So Pearl was like always described around like bright and sunny terms like she's still a happy pearl she's always been 
Nothing's really changing about her, but she knows something's up. The dress, so proper was it to little Pearl, seemed to an effluence or inevitable development, an outward manifestation of her character, no more to be separated from her than the many-hued brilliance, many brilliancy from a butterfly's wing or the painted glory from a leaf of a bright flower. As with these, so with the child, her garb was all of one idea with her nature. On this eventful day, moreover, there was a certain singular inquietude and excitement in her mood, resembling nothing so much as the shimmer of a diamond that sparkles and flashes with the varied throbbings of the breast on which it is displayed. So she has a lot of energy. She knows something's up. She's excited for the day. She, excitement. Children have always a sympathy in the agitations of those connected with them, always especially a, a sense of any trouble or impeding revolution of whatever kind in domestic circumstances, and therefore Pearl, who was the gem on her mother's un, on quiet bosom, betrayed by the very dance of her spirits, the emotions which none could detect in the marble passiveness of, he of Hester's brow. The evanescence made her flit with a bird-like movement rather than walk by her mother's side. So she is dancing in the marketplace, or dancing like around by her mother and being excited. She broke continually into shouts of wild, inarticulate, and sometimes piercing music. Note that that's weird. <laughs> that that's like not what the, the, the Puritans would appreciate or think of. Um, and even the words that he uses, that they're wild and inarticulate and piercing, um, that it's not like music to our ears, um, which seems to be how the Puritans would note her behavior, not necessarily um, how, how nature would, would perceive it. Um, when they reached the marketplace, she became still more relentless or restless on perceiving the stir and the bus and bustle that enlivened the spot, for it was usually more like a broad and lonesome green before a village meeting house than a center of a town's business. Why, what is this, mother, cried she? Wherefore have all the people left their work today? Is it play day for the whole world? See, there is the blacksmith. He has washed his sooty face and put on his Sabbath day clothes and looks as if he would gladly be merry if any kind of body would only teach him how. And there is Mas Master Brackett the old jailer, nodding and smiling at me. Why does he do so, mother? All these people have come and they're dressed up and it's very out of the, per out of the ordinary and Pearl doesn't know what to think of it. It's like very unpuritan like They're strange. They're happy. Puritans aren't happy and smiling at her ever. So this is really weird for her. He remembers the a little baby, my child, answered Hester. He should not nod and smile at me for... All that, the black, grim, ugly-eyed old man, said Pearl. He may not at thee, if he will, for thou art clad in gray and wearing, and wearest the scarlet letter. But see, mother, how many faces of, this, of strange people and Indians among them and sailors. What have they all come to do here in the marketplace? So there's sailors and Indians in the marketplace as well, along with the Puritans, and they're very different from the Puritans. They have a different lifestyle. They wait to see the procession pass, said Hester, for the governor and the magistrates are to go by and the ministers and all the great people and good people with the music and the soldiers marching before them. And will the minister be there, asked Pearl, and will he hold out both his hands to me and will thou lead me to him from the brookside? He will be there, child, answered her mother, but he will not greet thee today, nor must thou greet them. So even though it's like a different day, Dimsdale's still not going to acknowledge them. That's all she's ever wanted. God, that guy. What a strange man. What a strange, sad man is he, said the child, as if speaking partly of her, to herself. In the dark night time, he calls us to him and holds thy hand and mine. And when we stood with him on the scaffold yonder in the deep forest where only the old trees can hear, the strip of the sky to see it, he talks with thee, sitting on a heap of moss. He kisses my forehead too. 
so that the little brook would hardly wash it off. But here in the sunny day, among all the people, he knows us not, nor must we know him. A strange, sad man is he, with the hand always over his heart. So he only he acknowledges them in the nighttime. He, like, kisses her forehead, and he talks to Hester. But in the daytime, he doesn't. He pretends like he doesn't know them. Be quiet, Pearl. Thou understands not these things, said her mother. Think now not of the minister, but look about thee and see how cheery is everybody's face today. The children have come from their schools and the grown people from their workshops and their fields on purpose to be happy. For today, a new man is beginning to rule over them. And so, as has been the custom of mankind ever since a nation was first gathered, they make merry and rejoice as if a good and golden year were at length to pass over the poor old world. So Hester told her not to think about Dimsdale, but to think about the change in governor that's going to happen. Um. It was, as Hester said, in regard to the unwanted jollity that brightened the faces of the people. Into this festal season of the year, as it already was and continued to be during the greater part of the two of two centuries, the Puritans compressed whatever mirth and public joy they deemed allowable to human infirm, infirmity, thereby so far dispelling the customary cloud that for the space of a single holiday they appeared scarcely more grave than most other communities at a period of general affliction. But we perhaps exaggerate the the gray or the s or sable tinge, which undoubtedly characterized the mood and manners of the age. The persons now in the marketplace of Boston had not been born to an inheritance of Purita Puritanic gloom. So these people, the p other people in the marketplace, don't know like the Puritan ways, or they they don't ex act like in the Puritan way. Which means they're happier. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they were native Englishmen whose fathers had lived. In, sunny, in the sunny richness of the Elizabethan epoch, and a time when, life, when the life of England viewed as one great mass would appear to have been stately, magnificent, and joyous, so state opposite of Puritan, as the world has ever witnessed. Had they followed their hereditary taste, the New England settlers would have illustrated events of public importance by bonfires, banquets, pageantry, pageant trees and possessions, nor would it ha have been impractical in the observance of the majestic ceremonies to combine mirthful recreation with solemnity and give, as it were, a grotesque and brilliant embroidery to the great robe of state. This is all opposite of a way a Puritan would celebrate, if they ever celebrate, which a nation at such festivals puts on. There was some shadow of an attempt of this kind in the mode of celebrating the day on which the political year of the co colony commenced. The dim reflection of a remembered splendor, a colorless and manifold diluted rep repetition of what they had beheld in proud old London. We will not say a royal coronation, but at a Lord's Mayor's show might be traced in the customs which our forefathers instituted, which reference to the annual installation of magistrates. So this is like the one time a year they do anything to show celebration and it's when they are trading governors or changing governors the fathers and founders the fathers and founders of the commonwealth and the statesmen the priest and the soldier deemed it duty then to assume the outward state of majesty which in accordance with antique style was looked upon as the proper garb of public or social eminence all came forth to move in procession before the people's eyes thus imparted needed dignity to this to the simple framework of a government so newly constructed so this is opposite of puritan ways then too the people were countenanced if not encouraged in relaxing the severe and close application to their various modes of rugged industry, which at all other times seemed of the same piece and material with their religion. Here it is 
It is true. Were none of the appliances which popular merriment would so readily have found in the England of Elizabeth's time or that of James, no rude shows of theatrical kind, no minstrel with his harp and legendary ballad, no, nor gleeman with a ape dancing to his music, no juggler with his tricks of mimic witchcraft, no merry Andrew to stir up the multitude with jest, perhaps hundreds of years old, but still effective by their appeals to the very broadest sources of mirthful sympathy. So they have no form of entertainment. It's all, like, they have no acts, nothing, no ape dancing or anything like that. Um, all such professors of the several branches of jocularity would have been sternly repressed not only by the rigid discipline of law, but by the general sentiment which gives law its vitality. That's an important sentence just in the fact that it's not just law, it's that people create the law because of what they, like, the, it, it's the ethos of the people that actually influences what the law is, not only the other way around. Not the less, however, the great, honest face of the people smiled grimly, perhaps, but widely, too. Nor were sports wanting such as the colonists had witnessed and shared in long ago as the country fairs and on the village greens of England, in which it was thought well to keep alive on this new soil for the sake of the courage and man manliness that were essential in them. Wrestling matches in the different fashions of Cornwall and Devonshire were seen here in their about the marketplace. So there were wrestling matches as their form of entertainment, even if they like weren't specifically allowed. In one corner there in one corner there was a friendly bout at the quarter staff. And what attracted and most in what attracted most interest of all on the platform of the pillory, already so noted in our pages, two masters of defense were commencing an exhibition with the buckler and the broadsword. But much to the disappointment of the crowd, this latter business was broken off by the interposition of the town beadle, who had no idea of permitting the majesty of the law to be violated by such an abuse of one of its consecrated places. And that beadle brings us back to that second chapter, because um, he's the one who leads uh, Hester out of the, um, the prison in the first place. So we're getting a little bit of circularity by bringing some of these characters back and some of these ideas back of crowds of the Puritan crowds um, that are watching something. Uh, it may not be too much to affirm on the whole, the people being in then in the first stages of joyless department and the offspring of sires who had known how to be merry in their day, that they would compare favorably in point of, hol of holiday keeping with their descendants even at so long an interval in ourselves. Their immediate posterity, the generation next to the early immigrants, wore the blackest shade of Puritanism and so darkened the national visage with it that all the subsequent years have not sufficed suffice to clear it up. We have yet to learn, again, the forgotten art of gaiety. So their posterity, their children, are going to be born into the Puritan ways. And Calder's even saying, like, even in his time, hundreds of years later, um, that we are still Puritans. Um, and I think that he might argue that even now we still are. Um, that we still bring a lot of this to, to even our most jocular of time. The picture of human life in the marketplace, though its general tint was the sad gray-brown or black of the English immigrants, was yet enlivened by some diversity of hue. A part of Indians in their savage finery of curiously embroidered deerskin robes, warm-up belts and red-yellow ochre and feathers and armed with the bow and arrow and stone-headed spears stood apart with countenances of inflexible gravity beyond even what even the Puritan aspect could attain. Nor wild as were these painted barbarians with were they the wildest feature of the scene. So this is, the Indians are opposite of the Puritans and even like in what they wear. Uh, this distinction could 
more justly be claimed by some mariners, a part of the crew of the vessel from the Spanish main, who had come ashore to see the humors of election day. The humors are of election day are like just the odd, how everything's very odd compared to a normal day in the Puritan life. They were rough looking desperados with sun blackened faces and an immensity of beard. Their wide, short trousers were confined about the waist by belts, often clasped with a rough plate of gold and sustaining always a long knife in, and, in some instances, a sword. From beneath their broad-rimmed hats and palm-leaf-gleaned eyes, which, even in good nature and merriment, had a kind of animal ferocity, they transgressed without fear or scruple the rules of behavior that were binding on all others, smoking tobacco under the beetle's very nose, although each whiff would have cost a... So they're, right now they're talking about the sailors, and the sailors are different, and they have completely different lifestyle also than the Puritans and the Indians. They're smoking, they're wearing, like, out there clothes and everything. And notice that, that their clothes, like the, the Native Americans' clothes, are, um, are all in kind of natural colors. These guys have animal ferocity, which is natural, um, but in a very, very different way. These are not like people that, um, that Hawthorne would necessarily look up to, but he understands that that, that ferocity and that kind of um, that kind of anger is in some ways natural and okay. That uh, that that ferociousness and um, and bellicosity is okay. Um, that go, that it goes along with things because it is who they are at least. Um, even if they do have all of these other trappings, they're definitely different. So the the smoke would have cost a townsman a shilling and a, and quaffing at their pleasure draughts of wine or aqua vitae from pocket flask which, flasks which they freely tendered to the gaping crowd around them. It remarkably characterized the incomplete morality of the age, the age rigid, as we call it, that a license was allowed the seafaring class not merely for their, their freaks on shore but for a far more desperate for, but for far more desperate deeds on their proper element. The sailor of that day would go near to be arrogated as a pirate in our, own, in our own. There could be little doubt, for instance, that this very ship's crew, though no unfavorable specimens of the natural brotherhood, had been guilty, as we should phrase it, of des desperations on the Spanish commerce, such as would have periled all their necks in a modern court of justice. But the sea, in those old times, heaved, swelled, and foamed very much at its own will, or subject only to the temptuous winds with hardly any attempt at regulation by human law. Notice there the sea is, yeah, the sea is, has its own will yeah. and cannot be constrained by human law, which is the same as the sailor's. Um, that there are people that cannot, who refuse to be tamed by these, um, these rigid, rigid laws um, that seem to be doing the, the Puritans so well. Yeah, nature can't be contained by human law. The buccaneer on the wave might relinquish his calling and become at once, if he chose, a man of probity and piety on land, nor even in the full career of his reckless life, was he regarded as personage with whom it was dis disreputable to traffic or casually associate. Thus the Puritan elders in their black cloaks, starched bands, and steeple-crowned hats smiled not unbenignantly at the clamor and rude deportment of these jolly seafaring men, and it excited neither surprise nor anim anima diversion. When so reputable a citizen as old Roger, Roger Chillingworth, the physician, was seen to enter the marketplace in close familiar talk with the commoner and of the questionable vessel. Note, note there, the reputable citizen of, of Roger Chillingworth. Um, a little bit of irony there. Also, note he like is talking to the the um, captain of the ship, which might not be a good thing. The latter was by far the most showy and gallant figure, gallant figure, 
so far as apparel went, anywhere to be seen among the multitude. He wore a profusion of ribbons on his... On his anywhere to be seen among... Oh. He wore a profusion of ribbons on his garment and the gold lace on his hat, which was also encircled by a gold chain and surmounted with a feather. There was a sword at his side and a sword cut on his forehead, which by the arrangement of his hair, seemed, he seemed anxious rather to display than hide. A, so he was wearing like pretty out there clothes on Puritan like. A landsman could hardly have worn this garb and shown this face and worn and shown them both with such a gilliard air without undergoing stern question before a magistrate and probably incurring fine or imprisonment or perhaps exhibition in the stocks. As regarded the shipmaster, however, all was looked upon as pertaining to the character as to the fish of his glistening scales. So whatever he's wearing would have usually been like marked or like reacted to with a fine or imprisonment or even like being killed but the sailor or the shipmaster like regards it as part of his character like being kind of normal as parting from the physician the commander of the bristol ship strolled idly through the marketplace until happening to approach the spot where hester Prynne was standing he appeared to recognize and did not hesitate to address her as was usually the case hester stood a small vacant area a sort of magic circle had formed itself around her, and to which, though, the people were elbowing one another at a little distance. None ventured or felt disposed to intrude. Circle that magic circle. Um, we've encountered that at least once before with the sunshine, um, that Pearl was in a magic circle, um, and then I think that there was another one that Hester may have stepped into. I'm, I, I don't remember, but that magic circle um, that is kind of isolation and self, um, at this point. Um, it, we may see another one, another magic circle, I don't remember, but those magic circles are very, very important. Uh, it was a forcible type of the moral solitude in which the scarlet letter enveloped its faded wear, partly by her own reserve and partly by the instinctive, although, or though no longer so unkindly withdrawn, withdraw, unkindly withdraw of her fellow creatures. Now, if never before, it answered a good purpose by enabling Hester and the seamen to speak together without risk of being overheard. So Hester has her, her letter on still, but it's like becoming less of a, a sin or like a, a burden. And she's wearing it, but she can still talk to the seaman because it means nothing to him. And so changed was Hester Prynne's repute before the public that the matron in town most eminent for rigid morality could not have held such intercourse with less result of scandal than herself so mistress said the mariner i must bid the steward make ready one more berth than you bargained for no fear of scurvy or ship fever this voyage what with the ship surgeon and this other doctor and our only danger will be from drug or pill more by token as there is a lot of apo of apothecary's stuff abroad aboard which i traded for with a spanish vessel vessel so on when hester's taking this journey she the mariner is telling her not to be afraid of getting sick because they have doctors and stuff and which doctor hmm. possibly chilling work <laughs> but you know what mean you, inquired Hester, startled more than she permitted to appear. Have you another passenger? Passenger? Why not? You know, cried the shipmaster, that this physician here, Chillingworth, he calls himself, is minded to try my cabin fare with you. Aye, aye, you must have known it, for he tells me he is of your party, a close friend to the gentleman you spoke of. He is that in peril from, the old, from these old sour Puritan rulers. So Chillingworth is now on the ship. He's the doctor that they were talking about. So that's why Chillingworth was talking to the captain earlier. He's following Hester. They know each other well, indeed, replied Hester, with a mean of calmness, though in utmost consternation. They have long dwelt together. Nothing further passed between the mariner and Hester Prynne, but at that instant she beheld 
beheld old Ch Roger Chillingworth himself standing in the remotest corner of the marketplace and smiling on her, a smile which, across the wide and bustling square, though all the talk and laughter, thoughts, moods, and 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 interest of the crowd conveyed secret and fearful meaning. So it's kind of like a a revenge or like a what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sinister smile. Because he knows. Remember his eyes. He has already figured everything out. He he knows what they're trying to do, and he is not going to let Dimsdale out of his class and uh, and and Hester either. Very good. 